Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 155. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here on a weekly basis to take your health to the next level. This week, our featured guest is Vinny Tortorich. He's a celebrity fitness trainer, speaker, podcaster, and best-selling author of Fitness Confidential, Adventures in the Weight Loss Game. And Vinny is just such an interesting, fun dude. We actually were recently on his podcast, so we're going to put a link in the show notes over to that conversation. You'll notice with Vinny, the conversation just goes back and forth more than usual. We're just having fun. And yeah, we just really enjoyed this conversation. So we got an awesome review this week, and it's a nice short and sweet one. So I'm going to read you guys the review of the week, and it's five stars, and it's titled Massive Gratitude by Happer Girl from Canada. My best friend found you guys and immediately passed along your podcast. I love listening to you both. Such incredible guests and very well spoken. Thank you for all that you do. Well, thank you so much for your awesome review. You guys are sending in so many reviews. We are so grateful. So we are just trying to make sure that we read them all to you guys. So keep sending them in and we love them. Thank you. If you haven't taken the time to leave a review, it's super easy to do. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash iTunes. Only takes a few seconds. Helps give us a boost in the iTunes charts. So we thank you guys so much. So now a shout out to our show sponsor, Raw Elements. And since a lot of what we talk about today, and Vinny's going to get into it, his motto in life is no sugar, no grains. So Raw Elements carries an awesome product called Lacanto, which is made from monk fruit. So this has absolutely zero impact on your blood sugar levels, and you can use it in baking. So if you do love your sweets and you want to get your fix here and there, substitute Lacanto in your next muffin batter, cake batter, whatever it might be. You can even put it into elixirs and hot drinks. I encourage you to try Lacanto. It comes in golden and in white, easy to use. You can get in individual packs or in a big bag, and it will totally keep your sweet tooth going on without impacting your blood sugar levels in a negative way. And as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Raw Elements products. Super easy to take advantage of your listener discount. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash raw elements. And for listeners in the US and Canada, you can bundle that order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. Amazing products, super great deal. Go and take advantage. Now a shout out to Sun Warrior. And the Liquid Light, as you guys know, is one of Jesse Mine's favorite products. We use this daily, so I can't express it enough. And normally I talk about using it in the morning in your morning water, but also use it in your afternoon water. It's a great way to get your minerals in. So if you find that you're not getting enough minerals into your day or you're not eating enough good quality produce, you're going to get the insurance from using Liquid Light. It's also got fulvic acid. All you need is a capful in your water, sip on it. On an empty stomach, that's ideal. That way you'll absorb it and you're going to get the best dose of minerals. So Liquid Light from Sun Warrior, you'll love it. And again, as a listener of our show, you get 10% off all your Sun Warrior products. Super easy to take advantage. Just go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. And again, listeners in the US and Canada, you guys can bundle that order together, spend $100 or more, and you get free shipping. So go and get your Sun Warrior products on right now. So now back to Vinny and some of the highlights from today's show. He gets into what the best piece of fitness equipment is that doesn't cost much and works everything. You'll find out what that is. Vinny shares what to look for in a quality gym and trainer. He shares a story about when he was nine years old and saw Jack Lane on TV, and this turned him on to weightlifting. Vinny is adamant on staying away from sugar and grains, and he will explain this. And Vinny will also explain why he was known and is known still as America's angriest trainer. So much great information with Vinny. We love talking to him. This guy loves to talk. He's fun to listen to. So here we go with Vinny Tortorich. Hello, Vinny. Welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you guys for having me on. We're so excited to have you on. And Vinny, we have to ask, why are you known as America's angriest trainer? (laughs) God, when I first started doing this five years ago, I literally started the show because I I had written a book and I had no way of getting the book out there, Fitness Confidential. So it was suggested that maybe I start a podcast. And when you think about it, five years ago, no one even knew what the term podcast really was, even though it had been out for several years. It was still not many people knew about them. 
you know, I wanted to call myself America's trainer because, you know, I've been working in Hollywood as a trainer for a gazillion years. And Serena's my better half. She said, why don't you call yourself America's angriest trainer? Because you're not angry at people, you're angry for people. And I mean, yeah, it's kind of catchy. So we named it that. That was available. And then I kind of moved away from it a couple of years ago because once the show got popular and the book became this kind of huge deal, I ended up doing a lot of television and radio. And every time I was on television, you know, nationally, they would go, why do you call yourself America's angriest trainer? You're not so angry. You seem like a nice guy. And I went, I really got to drop that. <laughs> so we've largely dropped it. But once it's in the zeitgeist, I guess, you know, you can't ever really go away from it. Yeah, as our listeners can probably tell already, you're such a nice guy. So it's just fitting we had to ask right away, why this name? So Vinny, you talk quickly about how you've trained Hollywood types so this is writers, actors, directors, executives. What has this been like? How has this been for you in, in your journey here? That's interesting, Jesse, because I didn't come out to Hollywood to do that. I was one of the early trainers in the United States when they started calling trainers trainers in 1981-82, way back then. I saw a trend on the rise. I saw childhood obesity by the time 1990 came around. I saw childhood obesity becoming a thing long before people were actually talking about it. So I moved out to Hollywood because I wanted to do some programming, not so much be in front of the camera, but hopefully be behind the camera and produce shows where we talk to kids about eating right and exercising and all the things that I saw coming down the pike. Because in fact, I was also a PE teacher in the school. You know, at the time, the only thing that was available was Nickelodeon and Disney had channels. And they all took meetings with me and said, oh, we think this is a great idea. And this is wonderful. And what do you suggest we do? And I said, well, we got to get kids off of all these sugars and grains. And they would literally laugh me out of the building because they make their living off of telling kids to eat cereal and drink Coca-Cola and so on and so forth. So I was done before I could even get started. So I just kept doing my training business here so that I could earn a living, you know, while I was trying to get things off the ground. And lo and behold, Someone over at Playboy Corporation, who I was training, got me hired to work with a couple of the Playmates because once these Playmates do their spread, they start to gain weight. For the first time in their life, they have money and they're going to nice restaurants and the whole thing. And that doesn't bode well for a company like Playboy. So I got hired to work with Playmates. And Playmates are one step away from actual celebrities because, in fact, celebrities date the playmates. And that's how I ended up in that world. I mean, that's a long story, but that's how it happened. Well, let's talk about the actual journey from Louisiana, New Orleans, and ending up in LA. You share a story in your book about this in the car ride where you just blitzed and went straight through. First of all, like, where did this come from? And what was this journey like? I talked about it for three years, you know, I got really popular in New Orleans because there were really not a whole lot of trainers in the country back in the 80s, as I said. And Shape Magazine came down there and, and did an article on me. And I was doing some national television spots and everybody was saying, oh, you need to take this to the next level. But that's difficult to do when you're making more money than any other PE teacher in the world at the time. You know, it's like, wait a minute, I walk around in gym shorts every day and I'm making five times what I ever thought I would make in the Deep South. Why would I ever want to give that up? But at some point, it just became very clear that I had to make the move. Besides, the weather was a lot nicer out here. I had no aspirations of, you know, most people want to be an actor when they come out here. I, I had no aspirations like that because, in fact, I couldn't act my way out of a wet paper bag. I had it so comfortable in New Orleans that when I told everyone that I was finally leaving, they thought it was some kind of practical joke. It was like, there's no way you're leaving this. Yeah, I wrote about it in Fitness Confidential. I said, when I got in the car and started driving, I had to drive straight through because if I had stopped somewhere in Texas overnight, I think I would have gotten in my car and just driven back to New Orleans the next day. 
the subtitle of your book is The Adventures in the Weight Loss Game. So let's expand on this and talk about why you delved into this ever so popular topic. Well, over the years, I've read everybody's book. And every book is the same BS, right? It's eat right for your blood type. You know, it's always a trick associated with it. You know, the this diet or the that diet or, you know, buns of steel, lose weight in five minutes, you know, 10 pounds by the end of the day or get sexy abs in a week. And everything is about this, how we trick people into do things. And aside from that, you know, when I was a kid back in the 70s, there were no gyms. There were no big box gyms. If you wanted to find a gym, it was called Joe's Health Club on the corner somewhere. There was no 24-hour fitness or Bally's or LA Fitness or any of this stuff, right? At this point, you know, we have more gyms, we have more books, we have more magazines, we have more healthy products, if you will, yet we're the most unhealthy people in the world, more unhealthy than we've ever been. So what gives? I had to figure out a way to talk about this and let people know that all of this health was going to kill us, you know. So that's how I got the whole idea of adventures in a weight loss game. So continuing on talking about the book here, something that really caught my eye early on in the book is where you talk about being 50 years old, you don't own a home, a couch, a television, wherever you're at, when you want to pick up and move, everything fits into one car. So let's talk about this. How has this minimalistic lifestyle come to be and how has it served you in a positive way? You know, I've never been a guy that needed a lot of things, even though I've, I guess I've done better than average financially. When things kind of took off for me, I guess in LA, I had an apartment that had a bed in it and I was working so hard from the time I got here. All I needed was a bed and a fridge and a stove. Literally, I looked like the Unabomber. Now, when I first got here, I drove like a Toyota 4Runner, which was not a bad looking car. And when that car wore out, I would buy trucks and I would literally buy trucks with diesel engines because I wanted them to last forever. I didn't want to have to go buy another one in three years because I did a lot of driving. Since I was into this wacky sport, and I'm sure you'll get into that question later of ultra cycling, I didn't have really a reason for a couch. Because I wasn't going to sit on a couch. If I had any spare time on my hands, I was going to sit on a bicycle in my living room and just do that all night. So there was really no need to do anything outside of the Spartan lifestyle. And I noticed that both Jesse, you and Marnie are pretty young guys. And your generation is taking this whole minimalist lifestyle to a different degree. You know, you guys are living in yurts and living in little camper shells and converting buses into your homes and all this kind of stuff. And I think I was kind of on the forefront of that, although I did live in an apartment, right? But that's why I never had anything. And whenever I had dates with women, I couldn't bring them back to my apartment because even though it was very clean and very neat and there was no junk around, it literally looked like a sleeper cell. That's too funny. Yeah, no, Jesse and I, Jesse's definitely drawn to the minimalist lifestyle. Not so much myself. <laughs> I, I definitely tend to be more of a maximalist, but uh, it is it is very interesting just seeing how some people are choosing to live these days. But Vinny, what I want to do is I want to go back to the beginning of your fitness journey. And you talk about being nine years old and seeing Jack LaLanne and the influence that he had on you. So let's talk about this. I was one of those kids who was bullied in school. You know, I had a speech impediment. You can still hear it when I talk. And um, I went to a private Catholic school and you would think, oh, private Catholic, oh, it sounds nice. But, you know, you kind of get beat up on in those situations. And uh, I have always felt like if I was a superhero, you know, when you're a kid, you think like that. If I was a superhero, then they couldn't mess with me. You know, I was a nerd. But I knew that Superman wasn't real. As a kid, you know, oh, yeah, you know that Spider-Man is not real. But one day, I used to watch this show every Saturday. Everyone my age can tell you about this show. It was called Wide World of Sports. And they would literally span the globe, as they would say, they were spanning the globe. You know, the human drama of athletic competition, the agony of defeat, you know, all this stuff. I would watch that show every week. And I was living in the swamps of Louisiana. And... Here's a show that's showing you places like, I think in a book I mentioned Kitzbühel, Austria, and people are skiing and 
ice skating and, you know, you would see like curling from uh, Canada and all these different sports. And I was intrigued by all that. And so I would never miss that show on a Saturday. This is something else kids have to realize. When you were finished watching television, you had to then get up, walk over to the set and turn it off. Right. So television wasn't on all the time. There was no clicker. There was nothing. There was no remote controls. And there were, there were only three channels. When White World of Sports was over with, I walked over to the television to turn it off. And just then Jack LaLanne pops up. And I went, whoa, what do we have here? You know, the guy, he was like a real superhuman. I, I knew he was a real guy. He wasn't like Superman. But man, he had these arms and he had this chest. And he had veins in his neck and in his arms. And I was like, whoa, what do we have here? And I was watching Jack. I, I sat back and I started watching and he's doing push-ups, and he's lifting a bar over his head. And I'm going, oh, I guess if you do that, you can look like a superhero. Eight years old, I learned to become a superhero by lifting things over my head. So this was your introduction to weightlifting. Your uncle eventually introduced you to Joe, how is that name pronounced? Bonadonna? Bonadonna, yeah. Who was he? Wow. I'm going to get misty-eyed even talking about the guy. Joe was a real hero in my life. I went in the backyard after our wife's Jack LaLanne that day, and I put some bricks on the end of a, an aluminum pole. I started trying to lift it over my head, and the bricks would crash into my hands but every day I would go back there and I would lift this bar over my head, like literally once or twice. I thought that's all you needed. I was scarring up my hands and my great uncle, uh, my dad's uncle, who was in World War II, he noticed that I was all bruised up and he asked me what happened and I showed him my gym, like Jack LaLanne, and he put me in his car in his old Chrysler New Yorker. <laughs> there was a car called a Chrysler New Yorker. And uh, he drove me to meet this guy, Joe Bonadonna. This guy was bigger than life. He had more muscles than Jack LaLanne. He wasn't goofing on me like the other kids were at school. He treated me like an equal. And he was a friend of the family. You know, growing up in the South, where it's Cajuns everywhere, you know, the Italians would kind of stick together on the bayou. So Joe had grown up with my parents, yet I had never met this guy. So Joe took me in and... um he told me to be at his gym every day. After, he had a little gym in a garage. And he said, I want you to show up here every day after school. And the only way I could do that is by getting on the bus. So even if I was running a temperature, it didn't matter. Every day I got on that bus because that bus was the only way for me to get to Joe's gym in the afternoon. The guy literally changed my life. So this brings up the conversation of gyms, and I really want to get into this. I know you delve deep into this in your book on the industry of gyms and how do we choose the right one? This is such a complicated area because everyone thinks that the only way to get healthy and to get fit is to join a gym. So let's just have you riff on this for a bit. Well, you know, gyms are the worst and the best thing all rolled into one. Because when you think about it, let's just take 24-hour fitness, right? So you have a big box gym. It's got everything you can ever imagine. There's spinners, aerobic classes. They have um, Pilates, yoga. And then you walk into the main gym and you have every piece of equipment you can ever imagine. Treadmills, stair machines, elliptical machines, rowing machines. And then you have every piece of weightlifting machine that, that is built, everything that's current, and more dumbbells than anyone could ever use, and on and on and on, squat racks and power racks and everything else. And you go, wow, you get all of this for less than $40 a month. I mean, what a great world, right? Yet, that's the good side of it. If you know how to use the stuff, a guy like me can walk in there and implement every piece of equipment and use it to the best of my ability or decide which I want to use and not want to use because I'm an exercise physiologist. You know, that's what my degree is in. And I've been doing this my entire life. And I know how to use it, but most people don't. And that's where the bad side comes in because the gym hires these trainers and by and large, they're not good trainers. Most of them, if you looked at them, you can't tell the trainer from the guy they're training. You know, And I'm not saying this to goof on trainers or anything, because in fact, there are some good trainers in those gyms, but most of them are not. 
And if they weren't good trainers, they wouldn't be working in a gym. They would have their own gig. So you have a trainer teaching people how to do things wrong. When you walk into the gym, there's rows and rows of you know powder. And most of that powder contains high fructose corn syrup or sugar or wheat. You know, so the one place you go to get healthy, as soon as you walk in, they're trying to give you all these powers and liquids and goos and protein bars, and it's all just candy and punch. So the one place we go where we could get healthy if we knew what we were doing can also be a trap to become actually more unhealthy. I'm sure there's there's great trainers, obviously, and there's ones that aren't so good. And there's trainers these days that can actually go and get certified online. So people really need to know that there is this wide array of different types of trainers. So what would you recommend to somebody out there if they're looking to start working with a great trainer? Where do they begin? What do they look for? Yeah, first, let me be very clear. No matter what trainer you talk to around this country, and every trainer that might hear this podcast will kind of laugh to themselves and go, yeah, that's me. Most trainers will tell you every other trainer sucks except them. It's that kind of thing. I'm not that guy. As a matter of fact, I'm never looking for clients as a trainer. I got all the clients I could ever want. As a matter of fact, I don't see that many clients anymore. I just don't have time to. So I more than not turn people on to other trainers. So here in LA, I have a handful of trainers that I will push people towards. They're not particularly friends of mine. They're just people I know that are very good. So I'm not suggesting that all trainers are bad. They're good trainers. But most people don't know how to find them. I tell people, interview these people. You know, don't just go to the gym and pick whoever the gym hands to you. Make sure they have, at the very least, a college degree. And at the very least, that degree is at least in physical education, exercise physiology, maybe some nutrition. Make sure that these people have been around the block and they put their time in. I talk in the book about all of these certifications. You have 20 or 30 different certifications you could get nowadays. And I tell people all the time, Anyone can become a trainer in one day by going online. Would you guys agree with me on that? Or Yeah, no, it is true. I am a personal trainer, and I know that part of what I had to do to complete mine was online. There was definitely a practical, but I know some people opted out of that. Would you agree, Marnie, that anyone can go online and within five minutes, so to speak, and become a trainer, certified trainer? Yes, I would. It's crazy. And when you think about all the hard work you put in to become a trainer, and you look around and go, well, wait a minute. All I had to do is, and as a matter of fact, my attorney, when I wrote the book, my attorney went through the book and he goes, can you actually say this? And I said, yeah. And he literally went online. He is not in very good shape at all. The guy's an attorney. He knows nothing about fitness. The next day he called me and he goes, I became a trainer and a preacher all in the same day. So he got two certifications, one to become a preacher and one to become a trainer. That's how easy it is. And the other challenge, too, is that people need to find trainers that suit their needs, right? So just because a certain trainer is great, it may not be great for them. So I know you talk about the different types of trainers that are available, depending on maybe the person's goals or what they're looking for. A truer statement has never been spoken. The ones that tell people to watch out for are the online trainers, the ones that they run one or two marathons or they do a triathlon and they take the same program that they got from, say, Joe Friel or, or one of those guys. They literally bastardize the program, you know, cover it up enough. And then they go and start taking on business, selling someone else's program. Well, when I was a kid, that was called plagiarism. But now people just do it. You know, they become a trainer overnight. Have you seen this? Yeah, we definitely have. It's crazy, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, totally. In the book, I call them Joe Frio trainers, and um, I use a couple of other guys. And I said, well, you know, why go get the guy who plagiarized when for a couple of bucks or even for free, you could go hire the guys who wrote the programs? Well, Vinny, you, your words as a personal trainer, say a reasonable amount of exercise would be one hour a day, three days a week. So let's talk about how you go about optimizing this time you spend in the gym. Well, you know, one of the other things I say, you know, I do public speaking around the world and, you know, they introduce me as a celebrity trainer and people are expecting me to walk up there and say, you need to start exercising. And the first thing I say to people is exercise is a very poor way to lose weight. 
to think that exercise is a good way to lose weight would be to say that calorie in, calorie out actually works. And we know it doesn't, right? We know that for a fact. If it did, everyone who ever did Weight Watchers would be thin. And the fact of the matter is, they have less than a 2% attrition rate. But exercise is the most important thing you can do for your, um, your muscular system, your skeletal system, your, your cardiovascular system. In order to stay healthy, to stay youthful, to keep homeostasis where it needs to be, you need to move. Our bodies were never meant to be like sloths. We're not meant to sit around and do nothing, right? So at the bare minimum, you have to exercise for three hours a week. But I would tell people, if you really want to do some good, you should be doing at least five hours of aerobics a week or more. And on top of that, lifting some weights. And you don't have to lift a lot of weights. You don't have to be a bodybuilder. You don't have to do what those guys do. But just doing a few compound exercises on top of doing aerobics is kind of all you need. Are you also a fan of breaking up those hours into smaller chunks and kind of targeting exercise in terms of HIIT training or high intensity or doing little bouts of exercise throughout the day? Absolutely. That's another way to do it. People are busier than ever. People say, well, do I have to do an hour straight? Or what if I did 30 in the morning and 30 at night? All of that is good. Moving is good. You don't have to do it, in my opinion, an hour straight. Morning, you brought up high intensity interval training or HIIT training. And I tell people out of all the exercises that you can do, that's the one that you can't do every day if you're doing it correctly. Because by the very nature of high intensity interval training, you need a break. So if you did any kind of hit on Monday, you might not want to do that again until Wednesday or Thursday to give your body time to recuperate from it. Because if you're doing hit, and I know people are going to hear this and go, that jackass doesn't know what he's talking about. Au contraire. <laughs> this is something I've studied my entire life. If you go to any cycling coach on the international level and you say to him, how often do you have these guys doing intervals? And we're talking about top cyclists who are taking drugs, right? They'll say, oh, once a week, tops. We'll have them do a climbing day once a week. And that's it. And that's after they're in great shape. Because if you're doing that stuff too often, you're going to have diminishing returns. Would you agree with that? Or where are you on that? When, when we're tackling HIIT training, depending on the day, it is on, on and off days for sure. And some days are longer than others. So it can be as long as a 30-minute session to as little as a seven-minute session. So it really does depend on how intense or what the exercises that I'm doing. So for example, today I did spin class that was about 45 minutes long. So that was high intensity. Tomorrow, I will not be doing that again. I know that my body needs that time to recover. Right. Yeah. So you have it figured out. You see these people, they go to the quote unquote box every day and they're doing. And when all that started, I said, well, we're going to have a new round of injuries. So be prepared. And people said, oh, you're just jealous because you didn't think of that. And I went, no, no, no we're going to have a whole new round of injuries. And I think that's proving to be true. You can't overdo it. You can't work your body. Your body needs rest after work. Can we just humor our audience, Vinny, and share how many hours in a row you've exercised? <laughs> <laughs> uh, kids, don't try this at home. I've been an ultra athlete forever in a week. And people ask me this question all the time. Is ultra athletics healthy? And the truth of the matter is, it's probably not. But people think that ultra-athletes, in my situation, I, I did it mostly with cycling. And they go, oh, you're like Forrest Gump. You just wake up every morning and get on a bike. But in fact, that would only be once a week. So let's say my long day would be on Saturday. So early in the year, a long day might be two or three hours. But as the year progresses and you get closer to your competition, your long day is not two or three hours. It's maybe 15 or 18 hours or, or, or more. So that's one day that you spend on the bike. So you are like Forrest Gump on that one day. Literally a whole day. My goodness. Yeah. But then the next day on Sunday, you would sleep whenever you got home. Sometimes it was weird because you would take off like at three in the morning sometimes. And at midnight going into Sunday, you're getting off of the bike and then you sleep for a few hours and you come back and do a ride on Sunday. But then you would take Monday off, maybe do a an hour long spin, you know, at not at tempo, you know, at 70% of your heart rate on Tuesday. Same kind of thing on Wednesday, same kind of thing on Thursday. 
take Friday off, and then, you know, the long day again on Saturday. So it wasn't like you were doing long days every day. It was only once every seven days. Is this something you're still doing? Are you still on the bike for all these hours? No, I just don't have time for it. Serena, the wife, is actually, she's been getting ready to do bad water 135, which means that it takes like three years because you got to do enough qualifying races to get there. And we're hoping that she does it a year from this July. So I'm supporting her. I go out and help her and I do all of her training with her. That's a running race, by the way, the Badwater 135. And so my time has been put into doing that and, and her doing what she wants to do. But I had my shoulder fixed two years ago and the good people over at Specialized sent me this beautiful mountain bike, this S-Works mountain bike, and I've been riding it. And I told myself, yeah, yeah, I'll just spend an hour and two on it on the weekends, but I'm already up to four and five hours on a Saturday on a mountain bike. So to say that the itch might be coming on is an understatement, but I'm trying to keep it at bay. <laughs> Too funny. Okay, Vinny, let's talk about what you say is the best piece of fitness equipment we can get, which is the jump rope. And I love this because it's just so easy to use. It's so cheap. Why is this good for everybody to start doing? Yeah, you know, years ago, someone had asked me, like in a bar situation, they were like, so if you could pick one piece of home equipment, just one, what would it be? Would it be a stair machine? Would it be a, a rowing machine? Money does not matter. You, you could pick any piece of home equipment that works your whole body, and that's all you could do. Let's assume that you're on house arrest, and that's the only exercise you could do for the next year. And I thought about it for a couple of minutes. I said, can I do push-ups and sit-ups? No, 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 no. You could do one exercise for the next year. What is it? And you can't leave your house. It's got to be indoors. And I said, oh, it's simple. It's the jump rope. Number one, it's a weight-bearing exercise. Number two, it causes just enough vibration on your joints to where it will keep your bone grow. People forget that bones have to grow, right? And when you put pressure on bones, you will grow. You're also flailing your arms, so you're getting some upper body extremity work. And you're also building your coordination. Even though money didn't matter in the scenario, the most expensive jump rope I think I've ever bought was still under 10 bucks. So, <laughs> you know, it's the best way to go. Morning, you're a trainer. What would you do in the same situation? I love using the jump rope for myself. And I definitely did use it with my clients when I was training. And what's awesome about it too is that you can use it in between sets. So it's just a really easy, compact way to get in, you know, a minute of high intensity cardio in between a rep or a set, or if that's the only workout you can do in a day, it does cover everything. So I totally agree with you. Yeah. You know, and the other thing is, I'm glad you brought that up. Aerobically, you can stay in zone two if you want. You could kick it up a little bit and be in zone three, kick it up a little bit more and, you know, maybe do some double unders and get into zone four and stay there for a minute. I mean, it, there's so much you can do with a piece of gym equipment that costs less than 10 bucks. Vinny, let's talk about the mental aspect of exercise. And obviously, this comes into play with those long bike rides that you go out and do or did in your past. But you talk about how fitness is more mental than physical. So what do you mean by this? God, several things. Dr. John Rady, who's a very interesting guy. He's a professor, I think, at Harvard or maybe Yale, one of the, the exciting schools, he says that, you know, we're doing a disservice for kids now. We're not giving an, enough time to run around on playgrounds. We're pulling PE out of the schools. And we really need exercise for brain growth. And he's absolutely right about that. Exercise does everything. You know, we want to think of exercise as giving us these beautiful, lean bodies and all this good stuff. And that's all good, right? But in fact, exercise has everything to do with your mental health. It has everything to do with your cognitive health, meaning, you know, how your brain works. And if we don't get enough exercise, that will die off. A piece of it will die off, not to mention the well-being, the feeling of well-being when your body releases endorphins and so on and so forth. That's why it's so important. Even though I tell people I could get you to lose 100 pounds without getting off the couch, if that's the case. But it still won't make you a perfectly healthy person just because I made you lean based on your diet. You still need to get up and move. 
And Jesse and I are so big on even just going for a walk because the impact that just a long walk or a short walk, especially out in nature, can just have on your well-being is, is so immaculate. You know, Marnie, a true statement has never been made. I always tell people, if you spent an hour on a treadmill, most of the time you feel every minute of that, whether you're walking, jogging, whatever you're doing. You can have a television screen in front of you with your favorite TV show on. You're conscious of that entire hour. I go sometimes on four and five hour hikes. They feel like five minutes to me. You get back, you think of all the wonderful thoughts you had and everything. You solve all the problems of the world. You're getting some good vitamin D in your skin. You know, it's just this wonderful feeling, right? You get back and it's like, oh my God, I've been gone for five hours. Isn't that great? Not one cell phone, not one text, not one tweet, nothing. It's wonderful. So good. And Vinny, I want to jump back to your story and talk about when you got fat. So you share this story in the book. It's a good one where you're 21 years old. You're on a date and you didn't actually realize that you're putting on the pounds, but this girl pointed it out to you. So can you just share us what happened there? Yeah. You know, I went to school on a football scholarship to uh, Tulane University. And, um, you know, I'm not very tall. I'm, I'm six feet tall. And I, and when in my playing weight, I was 225. And I was ripped out at 225. I was big on weightlifting. I looked good at that weight. You know, there was no extra fat or anything. But I was never like really a body conscious person. You know, I never looked in a mirror a whole lot. I know that sounds weird, but that's just not me. I'm not a mirror guy. When I got out of football, I still wasn't out of college. I was on not a date date, but a casual date with a friend of mine, uh, Janie, who's become this big deal in life. I love Janie to death. And we, we're at this little restaurant called Camellia Grill in New Orleans. And I'm sucking down a milkshake and having a hamburger and you know, the whole thing. And I just said to Janie, kind of in passing, I said, yeah, I think the dryer is shrinking up my Levi's. And she goes, why? And I said, look, I, I'm having trouble. I can't even buckle them anymore. And she kind of did a, one of those spit takes through her nose, you know, and I, I went, what? What are you talking about? And she goes, oh, sweetie, you're getting fat. And I said, what? What are you talking about? What I did was I did like Popeye. I lifted my arms up and, you know, did some biceps, some guns. I said, come on, Janie, look at this. I'm hard as a rock. Come on. She goes, oh, yeah, your chest still looks good. Your shoulders are looking good. You know, but she goes, you're getting a gut. And I went, really? It, it didn't even occur to me that I was getting a gut. That night, I, you know, I went home. We had lunch, so I went home, and I was taking a shower. And when I got out of the shower, before I got dressed, I had one of those cheap mirrors on the back of my bedroom door. I stood in front of the mirror naked, and I looked at myself sideways. And it was almost like out of nowhere. I was 225 muscled up, right? So 275 where you could still see some muscles. I didn't look morbidly obese. You know, I, I could tell I was getting like a double chin. My face was fatter, you know, that kind of thing. There was a little extra fat over my muscles in my leg. But yes, there was a gut and love handles coming on. And I was the ripe old age of 21. I looked at myself in the mirror and then I looked at my face. I looked at myself in my eyes and I said, this is not going to happen. And that was the turning point for me. And that was a career move. And I didn't even realize it at the time. Which led to the bicycle. So you had the extra weight and this motivated you to go out and get a bike. Share the story of how much riding you were doing when you got that new bike for the first time. Again, we talked about it earlier in the show. I'm kind of a weird guy. And even when I was in college, I was weird about money and spending money and the whole thing. So I would compartmentalize money. You know, it's not like today where parents give their kids money. My parents, when I was in college, I didn't get money from my parents. So I would have to work hard for it. And I would allocate money. And one of the allocations was how much gas I had per semester, how much I could spend on gas. So when I decided that I wasn't going to be fat, I went out, I took my gasoline money, which was about 200 bucks. I spent 165 on it on a bike called a Fuji. I don't know if those bikes are still around, but I went to a bike store and bought a Fuji. They told me it was a sturdy, it was a good 10-speed bike and it would hold up. And so that was my gas money. 
So anywhere I went in New Orleans, I had to go on that bicycle because my car, I just didn't have gas money. I also used my pizza money to do things, you know, to eat healthier and the whole thing. And that's how that whole thing started. I found that not only was I taking my bike to class because I lived off campus, and if I wanted to go downtown, I would go on my bike, and I realized that a bike would get you downtown on St. Charles quicker than a car. So I became like this kind of little European guy where I was like, anywhere I went in New Orleans, I would ride a bike. And then it occurred to me that I was able to go at least 50 or 60 miles on my bike in one day. And my parents lived about 75 miles away. Now, we're talking early 1980s. And I said to myself, I wonder if it's possible for me to ride to my parents' house in the swamp. You know, I grew up on a bayou in the swamp. That was the beginning of me going long. You know, that ride that day, you know, just got on the bike one day and headed west until I got near Baton Rouge and you know went to my parents' house. Wow. And at what point did you start getting into racing? Around that time, you know, once you start hanging around a bike store, because when you ride a lot, the one thing you do wear out are tires. So I started hanging around the bike store and I would see these kind of quasi racer guys. And look, it wasn't like it is today. You know, New Orleans is kind of a European town. So they had a lot of French people there and they would ride bikes. And every now and then I'd buy a bike magazine where you can read about Bernard Hainaut and all these people who were doing the Tour de France and all this kind of stuff. So I was reading up on those guys from these kind of bike rags and hanging out at the store. And some of the local guys did what was called criteriums. And these are like really fast bike rides, you know, races within like a one or two or three city block area where they would just haul ass. So in order to support the guys I, were hanging, I was hanging out with, I would go to the criteriums, right, and watch. And one of the guys suggested, he goes, yeah, hey, why don't you jump in? You know, so literally I took the kickstand off of my bike at a bike race one day just to lighten it up a bit, you know. <laughs> and I got in the criterium and the only information I had was don't go off the back because once you go off the back and you lose the draft, you're done right? You got to hang on to the group or they will drop you. And um, that first criterium, I was on the back and I hung on for dear life and, you know, started riding faster and faster and doing interval training and all that kind of stuff. And before I knew it, I was one of those guys up in the front, you know, winning and coming out second and third in criteriums. And, you know, that's how that all started. And this takes me right into my next point, which is when you got more serious about bike riding, you ended up looking into what they call a hypoxic altitude tent. Let's talk about what one of these tents is and how it actually led to you finding out that you had leukemia. I read about a guy named Pete Pinsiers who won the race across America in eight days and something. And that became my intrigue to start doing ultra cycling and going longer and longer. And then at some point I got away from that because it wasn't paying the bills, even though I did a bunch of races mostly in mountain biking, I tried to come back in 2006. And I did the 508, which is a 508-mile bike race. And I was doing really well. I was in a top two or three. I somehow stripped a gear on one of my knees. Uh, I pulled the muscle right on the edge, right on the outer condyle of my knee. And my day was over with. So after 300 some odd miles, I was done. And I was hell-bent on getting home, rehabbing that, icing it, doing everything I had to, building it up again. And I was coming back in 2007 to do it again. One of the companies, you know, you have these hypoxic tents. And there was a lot of, back in 2005, 2006, this method of sleep high, train low, meaning sleep at altitudes, but train at sea level. Because... If you're sleeping at altitudes, you could build up more red blood cells, which is what carries oxygen. And then you would train low where you can train really hard. And the two would make you, quote unquote, superhuman. And one of these companies, I talked to a few of the companies, and these tents were super expensive. You know, you, you would literally put them around your bed. There was a tent around your bed in your bedroom that would literally pump nitrogen into the tent pulling out oxygen so 
it was like sleeping at 14 or 15,000 feet. So naturally, over time, you would build up red blood cells. And I couldn't really afford a $15,000 tent. So one of these companies said to me, hey, we'll give you a tent. But when you do the race, you know, it looks like you could win, at least be a top five. If you finish top five, would you mention our tent and media and all this kind of stuff? And I said, I would, but I don't believe in BSing people. So I would have to be able to prove that my hematocrit level actually went up. And they said, oh, we have faith in that. I said, so you send me a tent for free to use. They were, quote unquote, leasing me or renting me a tent for free. I was going to take a baseline score of my blood and then three months later before the race, get it checked again to say, hey, you know, my red blood cells went up this much because I used this tent and I finished X amount in the race. So that all sounded fair enough for me and fair enough for them. It was in that baseline test when we figured out that my blood was way off. What do you think would have happened if you didn't actually go through that and have that test? Uh, don't know. I would have probably died. I was getting sicker and sicker, and people kept telling me when I would run into friends I hadn't seen in a while, they would say to me, you sure you feel okay? And I was dropping weight. I was way below what I had normally weighed. I was muscle wasting a bit. Every now and then I would have these phantom pains in the middle of the night and I felt like I had to throw up, but then I couldn't throw up and I never get sick. And my friend who was a, a radiation oncologist, she kept insisting that there was something wrong with my blood, but she didn't know what it was. So she was shifting me from one specialist to the other to help me figure out. And all these Hollywood doctors, one doctor was like the head doctor for that TV show, uh, The Biggest Loser, and he couldn't figure out what it was. And I just got passed around. Meanwhile, I was still riding a bike 15 and 16 hours on a Saturday. But eventually they figured it out. Here's the crazy part, Marnie. Had I fallen on my bike, it's a fair chance that I would have bled out because I had no platelets left in my blood. My blood was like Kool-Aid at that point. You know, it's just such a story. And uh, it was really fascinating reading that and hearing, you know, where you've come through today. So I actually want to get into another interesting area and something you're really adamant on. It's even the hashtag on your Skype. No grains, no sugar. <laughs> Let's talk about your food philosophy. Yeah, no sugars, no grains. That has been my trade secret in the fitness business. It was why Hollywood would hire me more than other trainers. You know, I was quote unquote, one of those, you know, celebrity trainers, and I still work with celebrities. One of my clients, uh, Dean Laurie, you know, he's on my book with me. His name is on the cover of my book. Dean Laurie is best known for shows like Arrested Development, My Wife and Kids. He re rewrote a bunch of like the Happy Gilmore movies. Uh, the, the guy's well known as a producer, writer in Hollywood. And uh, Dean and I had have a very close relationship. He kept saying to me, you should write a book. I said, Dean, I'm not going to write a book because no one's going to listen to what I have to say. And he kept saying, after cancer, he kept saying, you almost died with all these secrets. So why don't you write a book now? And he caught me at a moment of weakness. I said, okay, I'll put it out there just to prove that no one will buy this book. And boy, was I wrong. Everyone took on the no sugars, no grains thing. I literally had to go out and trademark the term NSNG, no sugars, no grains, because it all happened so fast that I wasn't expecting any of it to happen. Let's take this a little bit further. So you're no sugar, no grains. What does your diet look like? I mean, a lot of people, and I'm guessing you might be in this camp as well, don't like to put labels on the diet, but what does your current diet look like? Well, people try to uh, lump it in with Atkins. They try to lump it in with ketogenics or paleo and all that kind of stuff. It's none of it because it's a lifestyle. It's not really a diet. It's a lifestyle. And what no sugars, no grains actually is, is you can eat all the vegetables you want. You can eat all the chicken, fish, pork, red meat that you want. You're just staying away from the things that cause inflammation. You know, look, right before I was talking to you guys, I was talking to uh, Dr. William Davis for an hour on my podcast. He's the guy, the wheat belly guy. 
we were talking about the things that cause inflammation, you know, sugars and grains. And if you just stay away from what causes inflammation, you could keep all kinds of diseases at bay and you can also lose weight. And I've been challenged over the years. I had this woman and she came to me and she goes, well, women need extra carbohydrates, so they need grains. And I said, oh, you need extra carbs? And she goes, yes, I'm a woman. I need extra carbs. And I said, okay, just eat extra vegetables. And she goes, no, but I need grains. And I said, for what? Because in human existence, grains are only a recent thing. Humans have lived for tens of thousands of years, no problem, no grains. You know, the grains have been around for 10,000 years. That's it. We don't need them. Our bodies were never set up for them. And we get all the sugars we need from vegetation. Why try to bring sand to the beach? Yeah, we just had Dr. William Davis on our show, actually, and just released the episode. And People have been loving it. We talked about his new book, Undoctored, and, and again, all about grains and how they just don't belong in the diet. Yeah, you know, that's why he was on my show, um, to talk about Undoctored. And I think he's right. There's so many people who have been following No Sugars, No Grains for years now. And we see the, the uh, success stories. There was a group early on, and it's a Facebook group. And folks, you guys might want to go check it out. I don't make a dime on this. Almost everything I do is free. I mean, you got to pay for my book, but that's about it. But there's a group that started up on Facebook called Vinny Tortorich's No Sugars, No Grains. I do not own the group. I'm a member like everyone else. They made me an honorary... Um, Administrator? Yeah, but I don't even do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. You know, the group has almost 20,000 people in it at this point. And I go in there and I swear to God, I get misty-eyed. Because people, I, I lost 200 pounds. I was dying of cancer. I was on five medications. My doctor told me I'd never get rid of fatty liver disease. You know, I had sleep apnea. I had every bit of all types of metabolic syndrome. I had lupus disease. I had Crohn's disease. And they're all talking about, I'm not on medication anymore. I'm not on medication. When you hear that, you go, wow. And that's all because they just walked away from eating sugar and eating grains. Every week, someone walks up to me and they'll say, I'm ready to lose the weight, Vinny. You know, people we got to dinner with and that. I'm ready to lose the weight. Give me the elevator pitch of what I have to do. And I'll say, well, you got to cut out bread. Oh, I can't give up bread. Well, just a minute ago, you said to me, I would do anything to lose the weight. And the first thing I tell you to do, you tell me you can't do, so I, I guess it's game over. I don't have anything else to tell you unless you want to be helped. What else would you tell that person? I would tell them to cut out the grains, cut out bread, cut out pasta, cut out any kind of sugar that you don't need. I would tell them to limit their fruit to avocados, olives, and berries. On the occasion, you can have apples and pears. But any kind of tropical fruit, I would tell them, get rid of. It's just full of sugar. You, there's no reason for, reason for dates or papaya or uh, bananas. Or, and they're, oh, are you telling me a banana is going to kill me? No, a single banana will not kill you. And if you're having a banana on occasion, you're fine. It's what people do on a daily basis that will get to them. Let's talk about supplementation quickly. What are your thoughts on someone getting their nutrients through food versus supplementation? Before I say that, full disclosure, I own a vitamin company. I don't want people to think, oh, he came on here and he fed him a Quistin. I fed <laughs> you guys no Quistin. Not at all. But I own a vitamin company, so obviously I believe in taking vitamins. But I also tell people that vitamins are not to be taken in place of a healthy diet. I don't believe in all supplementation. There's a lot of BS out there that I would tell you save your money on, things that can actually harm you. But if you're taking a good multivitamin, because we just don't get what we need from the soil anymore, you know, we have factory farming, we don't get the vitamins we need. William Davis and I were talking about that. We don't get the D, D as in dog, we don't get enough anymore. If you're a vegan or a vegetarian, you don't get B12 at all. You know, you need to take that. Well, you know, everyone's slathering on sunscreen, you know, we don't get the D from that. Everyone, and I mean everyone, is lacking in magnesium. You should be supplementing with that. So even with the perfect diet, on top of it, you need supplementation. At the very least, a multivitamin. 
makes sense. You know, the quality of our food these days obviously is not as good as it once was. And I believe in intermittent supplementation, you know, depending on what we're going through or the time of year. So those are the top ones that Jesse and I even subscribe to on a regular basis. By the way, I don't make a fish oil supplement, so I'm not trying to sell a product that I have. I suggest if you do nothing else, go out and take fish oil, period. Why is that? Can you elaborate a bit? Yeah, we don't get enough of our omega-3s. You know, fish oil, it will bring a game to the table that's just missing. So much of regular fish have mercury in it now. The fish oil does not. So you're safe with fish oil. Vitamin D and D3, I would tell people to take also. I'm working on a D3 supplement right now. It's not out, but I won't put anything out. My company's called purevitaminclub.com. I won't put anything out until it's the absolute best. I've been working on a D3 for a long time. But even though I don't have that, go out and get that, folks. Take a D3. So, Vinny, we would love to hear how you start your day. What does the first few hours of your morning look like? Well, yours starts at 2 a.m. sometimes, right? Well, not anymore. I quit the 4 o'clock stuff. I try to sleep through the night. Sometimes people will see me tweeting at 2 and 3 in the morning, and they'll say, dude, you got to go to bed. Then I'll realize that I had been to bed and woke up. When I get up at a regular time, five o'clock or so, I start with a cup of coffee and I usually put heavy cream in it. Sometimes I drink it black and I literally do an hour of calisthenics, mostly working on my right shoulder, which I had replaced two years ago this month. So that's the first hour of my day on the floor calisthenics. You know, I'm 54 years old and I want to keep what I have. You know, it's kind of a stop loss. And then I get into my schedule a bit. Usually I, I do consults over at vinnytorich.com and people can sign up for consults. So I start doing those in the morning. You know, I have a couple of clients. I don't see clients every day anymore, but I'll go run off and see those people. In most cases, they're like family now. So I'll do that. And then usually I hit the gym and I'll do an hour, an hour and a half at the gym of mixed zone two aerobics and some weights. You know, that's kind of how my day works. I podcast five days a week. So at some point I have to set time aside uh, for that. Wow, that must keep you super busy. We're putting out one show a week and, and see what goes into that. So good for you. We do four every week and a fifth every other week. And on top of that, I do Adam Carolla's show twice a month. And sometimes he calls me in three times a month to do the show. So, and that takes time. I have to go to Corolla Digital and, you know, it's a couple of hours and the whole thing. But I love doing that show. I love Adam. And I have a life of just basically broadcasting at this point. Sounds like a lot of fun to us. We love it. Benny, just to come full circle on the cancer story, because we kind of left that abruptly, what is your current status with that? Um, wow, again, I was talking about that with uh, Davis this morning. They knocked my cancer down into what's called a chronic stage, meaning they knocked it back to where it was it was invisible, even though there was still cancer in my bone marrow. And they told me that within five years, I would have to be on chemo again. I'm coming up on 10 years and there's still no cancer they can see in my system. And I attribute all that to literally staying away from sugars and grains. And you get into great detail towards the end of the book, or actually right at the end of the book, when you found out that your cancer was really knocked back and, and you went and did the Furnace Creek 508 race and finished the race. So I'd love for you just to tell a little bit you got into, again, great detail, and there's a number of chapters on it, but what was this race like, and what did it feel like crossing that finish line? You know, again, it was one of those things where it was like, okay, I got a second chance to live. I had only found out in early 2008 that the cancer was, you know, in remission, so to speak. I said, okay, now what? When they tell you, you know, you have a chance to die, you have a greater chance of dying than living, everything goes into trying to live. And I think only people who have had cancer or had some sort of life-threatening event, when you come out the other side, you spend so much time just being obsessed with this living thing that the rest of your life kind of got put on hold, right? And now that event was over with, and I was getting all kinds of calls from cancer, you know, hey, you know, you're a coach, you know, you want to come coach, uh, you know, the leukemia, this and that. I was like, no, you know, I, I don't want to do any of that. I need to figure out how to put my life back together. And I started riding the bike and I said, you know, I wonder if I'm really 
done with this cancer thing. And the only way I can prove that is by riding the crap out of this bike. So, you know, in 2006, I failed at that event. You know, I got hurt with my knee. I found out while I was training in 2007 that I had cancer. And now I was like, you know what? My knee is better. My cancer is supposedly in remission. Let's see if I can do this. There's a photo in the book that after the race, there's a picture of me. I literally look like the Crypt Keeper. I have no fat on my body. I'm way too skinny. My shirt's off. I'm in the hotel room right after the race. I just took a shower and Serena snapped a photo. And I look like crap in that photo. <laughs> and I put it in the book. And I probably came back too fast. I should have probably built up for a year. But I had to prove to myself that I was still alive. You know, I was doing really well in that race. There's actually a, a thing online. There's a five-minute video of that race that year. At one point in that race, I was in second or third place. Things kind of started going wrong in the last 150 miles. Started throwing up a lot, started having trouble. All kinds of stuff happened. I talked about the magic milkshake and hamburger I had when I got to Baker. And somehow I eked it out. I ended up finishing 20th out of like 120 people. So I still had a good finish. But in hindsight, I had no right being in that race at all. I just wasn't healed up enough yet. And give us just a little bit of perspective of what this course was like. It was so grueling and so intense, just to give the listeners a bit of a feel. Yeah, you know, that route, even though the 508 continues in Nevada, the original route is no longer. It starts in Southern California, just north of where I live. It goes through the Mojave Desert, and that's the coolest part of the ride. You know, it's in September in the Mojave Desert. The coolest part of the ride is like 85 degrees, something like that, 90 degrees. But 200 miles into the race, you go over a um, mountain grade. Sometimes you're at 15 and 17 percent grade. And it's literally you go a mile high in the sky within 11 miles. When you get to the top, you drop down into Death Valley. That's when it really gets hot. Even at night, it's over 100 degrees. And the race is just grueling. And if that's not bad enough, when you're climbing out of Death Valley the next day, because you have to climb out of that bowl, you know, it's kind of a hellhole of the world. When you're climbing out, the roads are so bad, it feels like the seat is getting pushed into your esophagus through your butt. Everything hurts. And it's an epic course. It's an epic race that doesn't happen anymore in its original spot. And that's kind of a shame. The National Park Service kicked Chris Cosman and the race out of there for no reason whatsoever. They just decided, we're the government. This is what we're doing. People look at that race as a spiritual experience because you're out in the desert. You feel like you're in on the moon. It's like a moon landscape. And it's hot as hell. And you're doing this kind of majestic thing. For how many hours? You have 48 hours to finish. I think that year I finished in 34 and some change, maybe 33 and some change. I don't remember. The winner usually finishes in somewhere between, depending on the year and how much wind and how hot it is. The winner finishes, I don't think anyone's ever come in in under 30 hours. Maybe someone's done 29 something. But most winners finish in 30 or 31 hours. A majority of the field comes in the second night, meaning after 38 hours, like 39, 40 hours, something like that. That's when you'll see a majority of the field coming in. And some people finish in 47 and a half hours. You know, you see that every year. You know, it takes them two days to finish. Sounds like such a bittersweet experience, but what an accomplishment, Benny. That's amazing. Oh, thanks. But, you know, a lot of people do it. People ask me if it takes any kind of special skills to be an ultra cyclist. I tell them it doesn't take any special physical skills whatsoever. It only takes your mind. It's a mind over matter thing. I feel that anyone can do it. Serena, who was never an athlete, she started off life as a model back in Europe and she became a, an actress. These are not people who become ultra athletes. And she started running when she was 45, uh, but, you know, right before we met. We met right after cancer. She started running around that time, and she was trying to get to the half marathon level. And she was on my crew for the several races. And one day she asked me, she goes, 
I really like running. Is there a running version of this? And I laughed and said, the running version is way bigger than the cycling version. And um, I'm very proud of her because she's a non-athlete who, at 55 now, has turned herself into an athlete. Seems to be the theme of today, you know, just that our approach to anything really is a head game. So come full circle. Thank you for sharing all this. Before we wrap up, Jesse and I love to do something fun, a rapid fire round, just to get to know you a little bit better. Sound good? I hate rapid fire. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, of course. (laughs) All right. First question. What is your greatest fear? Uh, Rattlesnakes. What's one of your goals for the next year? To buy a miniature train set. What is one inspiring book that you read over the last year? Uh, Adam Carolla's book, In 50 Years, We Will All Be Chicks. What is something you're most proud of that most people don't know about you? The fact that it took me a lifetime to meet the right woman, that I could actually have a relationship. What are three things you are grateful for? I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for having wonderful parents. And I'm grateful that you guys had me on the show. Well, Vinny, it's been our pleasure. And in wrapping up, no longer in the rapid fire question round, one question we ask all the guests at the end, what is a challenge for our listeners, something they can take on in the next week to help them reach ultimate health? I tell everyone, do one thing every day that you know is good for you. It could be to you know not eat that pizza and not to go, oh, okay, I'll just, just go to the gym or right, start today. That's the one thing I, I, I hope I get that across to people all the time. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't go, oh, yeah, it's the weekend. I'm going to start on Monday. No, if it's Friday, your body doesn't know if it's Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Just start. If you're hearing this right now and you want to get started, start today. And the other thing I tell everyone, if I can have two things, may I have two things? For sure. I say it in my book. I really mean it. It was a guy that meant everything to me in my life. He said to me as a young kid, in life, always take the garbage out. And what he meant by that was, If you open up a cabinet and you see the garbage can is full, don't close the cabinet and make that someone else's problem. It's full. You take it out right now. And if you start doing that with the garbage can, it mutates into everything else in your life. You won't wait for everyone else to do things. You will do things yourself. And trust me, you will be a happier person for it. What a wonderful analogy. I love that we ended on that. I'm sure we can all relate where we've gone up to the garbage can and it's just overflowing and we just try and balance that last piece on there, just grab the garbage, put it out, do what you need to do, and what a wonderful way to live life. Yeah, I like it, and it's worked wonders for me in my life. I mean, look, I started off on a bayou in Louisiana. I was born on a bayou, as the song says. I'm not supposed to be a guy who's living with a pretty famous actress in Hollywood. This was not supposed to be my life. But just by doing things every day, you end up getting what you want. Can you just give us, since we've talked about your partner a few times, is her name Serena? Yeah, uh, Serena Scott Thomas. She's one of the two Scott Thomas sisters. Uh, Her sister is um, Kristen Scott Thomas, who is more well-known in the acting world. But Serena, Serena's done quite well. I mean, she was Bruce Willis's wife in one movie. And her claim to fame is she was the oldest Bond girl at the time of her appearance in a Bond movie. So she's a Bond girl. And uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I'll give you guys a piece of information that no one else knows. She just got a uh, gig. It's a small scene, but she's opposite um, Denzel Washington in a movie that will be out in a year or so that she's shooting in the next couple of days. So even though she doesn't do acting full time anymore, She's good enough to be in movies with Denzel Washington, you know, and that kind of thing. So I'm proud of her. I'm proud that she still does it and she works hard every day. And she does a lot of uh, voiceover work when she's not doing that. Very cool. Thanks for sharing. So for our listeners, you need to get a copy of Fitness Confidential, Vinny's book. You guys can get more on all of his awesome stories. And Vinny, how else can our listeners get in touch or stay connected with you? I am easily found on Twitter where I answer every question of everybody every day. I am vinnytotaris.com. You can go there. Fitness Confidential is the name of the podcast and the book. And that's about all you need to know. All right, Vinny, we're going to link all that up in the show notes, ultimatehealthpodcast.com. And Marnie and I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Your story is so inspiring. And the information you provide is just fantastic. So thank you. Uh, Thank you, guys. 
You're very welcome. Have a great day, Vinny. We hope you guys enjoyed that conversation as much as we did with Vinny. So engaging, so fun. He's a storyteller and, you know, there was so much great information brought up in this show. So we are loving how much you guys are sharing where you are, what you're up to on Instagram. So lots of people are tagging us in their stories and on pictures. Keep that up. For those of you who are not following us yet on Instagram, go ahead and follow us at Ultimate Health Podcast. We are posting daily. We're posting recipes. We're posting our upcoming shows, all kinds of fun stuff that's happening in our awesome life. We'll see you guys over on Instagram. Have a fantastic week. Take care.